Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, who already answered the Rasulahu the Buddha, was the Prophet, and he was the Prophet, and he was the Prophet, and he was So he says, it is he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sent his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with guidance in the religion of truth, prevailing it, making it prevail over all others, to the dismay of those who associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this verse is a uh, prophecy that is currently uh, coming true. It seems like in a few years, we will be the last traditional deen uh, standing, as it were. Now, we believe as Muslims that Islam, so this religion that was brought to us by the Prophet Muhammad, this deen of haq, the religion of truth, uh, this is not to say that other religions uh, don't contain elements of truth. Uh, of course, they do. Um, the Quran is a confirmation, a musaddiq of, let's say, biblical tradition, but it's also a corrective. Um, the Quran is al furqan, the standard of truth. The Quran is uh, Muhammad alayhi, and the overseer of the previous uh, scriptures. So we, we definitely have in common uh, a lot in common with other religions, but there are also crucial differences. Um, and it's these differences that actually make our deen unique. Um, it's these differences that make our deen superior. And I don't say that in an arrogant way. Um, it's just simply true. Our deen is superior. And if we didn't believe that, then we probably wouldn't be here. And I made a conscious choice as an adult to be a Muslim, uh, to follow Islam, because I believe it is uh, objectively better than other religions and objectively better than uh, atheism. So it's like in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Prophet to say, I am a human being like you. The Prophet is a human being like everybody else. Yuha ilayya. But revelation comes to me. Ah, so this quality makes him unique, sallallahu alayhi wa This difference makes him superior. He's a messenger of God, and not just a messenger of God, uh, the last and final and greatest messenger of God. And this is part of our basic aqidah as Muslims. The word aqidah comes from a root meaning to bind something. So these are beliefs that we are bound to, or beliefs that bind us. So we are bound to the belief that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the last and final and greatest messenger of God. He said in the hadith, Ana Sayyidu Adam wa la I am the master of the children of Adam and I do not boast. This is not a boast, he's not bragging. Uh, it is mustahil for a prophet to commit kitman or to conceal something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered him to convey. This is simply the truth. And we have confidence in this. And the, the word faith, unfortunately, has been tarnished by new atheism. People like Richard Dawkins, right? They, they say that faith means belief without evidence. So I like to use the word confidence. What does, what does the word confidence mean? In the Latin, con, with fides, faith. It just means faith. But it doesn't carry the baggage the word faith does. So we believe in the Prophet ﷺ. We have confidence in the Prophet ﷺ precisely because of evidence. In the Quran, he is called al bayna the evidence. al bayna lam yakun illadina kafru min ahli kitabi wal mushrikina munfakina hatta ta'ati humu al bayna Rasulun min Allah yatru shuhufa al-mutahara fiha kutubun qayyuma. That he is the evidence. So it's easy to say, and sometimes it's very tempting to say, that all religions are essentially the same, and that these differences don't really matter. But that is a misrepresent, misrepresentation of Islam as well as these other religions. That's doing a disservice to humanity. These differences matter, and they are important. I personally know a guy who identifies as a pro-choice Catholic. Pro-choice, by the way, is a circumlocution. It's a euphemism. It's a way of saying pro-abortionist. And that is also a circumlocution. That's meaning... Pro-abortionist means pro-death, pro-murder. Pro-choice Catholic is essentially an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp. So I said to him, but the magisterium, the tradition and binding teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church is against abortion. He said, I don't care. And I say, well, can, can you be a Unitarian Catholic? And he said, no. And I said, well, what's the difference as long as we're picking and choosing 
So details matter. Definitions matter. The word definition is from de finis in Latin, meaning concerning its end, concerning its parameter. A definition delimits something. In Arabic, it's called the had, a bound or a parameter. If words don't have definitions, then they become meaningless. Or if definitions are constantly changing, they become meaningless. The Prophet ﷺ said, يَأْتِي أَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يَبْقَى مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا إِسْمُ He said that towards the very end of time, right, towards the very end of time, nothing will remain of this religion except its name. It's going to become a name without a reality or an essence. In other words, people will say they're Muslim, but they have nothing to do with Islam. You know, like I'm a non-binary Muslim who believes in reincarnation and practices an alternate lifestyle. You know what I mean? You can't define me, but Allah and his messenger and the ijma have defined Islam. Sacred texts that are wadih and muhkam, clear, unambiguous, unequivocal, have defined our religion. If these texts can mean whatever we want, then they mean nothing. Islam has a normative definition. And if you breach that definition, you are not Muslim. It's that simple. There are millions of people in the world right now in major existential crisis, in major theological crisis, in moral crisis. It's a total jungle out there. There are millions of people in the world right now whose entire worldview has been turned on its head by the current zeitgeist, the current spirit of the age, by this pervasive and pernicious culture that makes them question their own common sense, their own intuition. So common sense, uh, fundamental principles of being, language, meaning, definitions, objective truth, all of this is being challenged. You can spend $100,000 on a college education and you walk out of that college uh, saying to yourself, are there more than two genders? You've lost your common sense. You got took, that's getting robbed. That's called grand larceny. This new generation of children are steeped in nihilism. This idea that ultimately there is no objective meaning to life. That you can give your life any meaning you want. Existence uh, precedes essence, they say. This is from Sartre, this is a French uh, philosopher. In his uh, consort, Simone de Beauvoir, one of the founders of uh, feminism, she said, quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. No one's born a woman. A rejection of human nature, of human essence. This is called existentialism. That you can make your own reality. It's all about you. So a traditional theocentric life, a life centered around God, is being replaced with an essentially egocentric life. With the ego in the center, the nafs, is a very subtle type of shirk. <clears throat> it's called egolatry, worship of the ego. And this happens when people impute the unique nature of God upon themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, uh, Have you seen the one who takes his ego as his God? This is all related to this revolt against normativity. And this movement toward queer identity. What does queer mean? It means unique. It means different. It means special. It means individual. You can't define me, my identity, my gender. I am the undefinable. I decide what I am. I am whatever I want to be. There's nothing like me whatsoever. All of you have to bow down to my ego. If I decide that I'm a 75-year-old Asian woman, all of you have to submit to my ego. Because Anna Rabbukum al A'la. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Ulul al bab the people of essential understanding in the Quran. What did they say? Ma khalaqta hadha batila. Subhanaka faqina adab al nar. These are the people of lub, essential understanding. You did not create this for nothing, in vain. Glory be to you. Save us from the punishment of the fire. The central message here is that existence has objective meaning. Your life has objective meaning. 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if you're not on social media, even if you don't have any friends, even if two people in the world don't know your name, you mean something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa hasbun Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffices us. We must not let this world deceive us. The only opinion that matters is the opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So chaos is everywhere. You have moral, existential, theological, social chaos. Of course, chaos is the opposite of cosmos, meaning order. So disorder is everywhere. So people should know that Islam has something unique and elegant and beautiful and reasonable to offer them. And by Islam, I don't mean submission in some sort of uh, broad sense. So I'm not talking about Islamun, like with a tanween or Islam with a lowercase i. Everything is in a state of Islamun, <clears throat> whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not. Everything is submitted to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the decorative will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I'm talking about is al-Islam, the message brought to us specifically by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is his preferential will. So a Muslim, capital M, strives to do those things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we know his preferential will? He tells us in his prescriptive will, in other words, his kitab, his wahi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his kitab that the Quran is shifa'un mima fis sudur. The Quran is a healing, a cure for what is in the hearts of humanity. And people are afflicted everywhere with spiritual maladies. And in many cases, they don't even realize that they have these diseases. There's doubt and hypocrisy. There's arrogance. There's vanity and heedlessness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure us of all such diseases. I usually have problems with microphones. Uh, it's thought that has to happen to So, watering down our religious beliefs unnecessarily, or attempting to combine somehow <clears throat> to equalize all of these religions, it compromises our distinctiveness as a religion. It compromises the Quran's distinctiveness as a scripture as a unique book of healing. There is something very special about Islam. There is something special about the Quran. There is something special and unique about the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And we should make no apologies about this. This is the truth. However, we must also show humility before Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. The Prophet Wasallam said, Man tawada alillah rafa'ahu Allah, wa man takabbara wada'ahu Allah, wa kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. And this is, a, this is a spiritual principle. It's not a mathematical principle or a biological principle. A spiritual principle, a spiritual law. If we are humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will raise us. But if we are arrogant, Allah will debase and humiliate us. Almost the exact statement is attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament. See, the Christians, they have these spiritual laws. So people who believe in ultimate accountability, they have these spiritual laws. But people who love the dunya and cling to the dunya, this ephemeral and perishing world. They follow other principles, like just do you, or do what thou wilt, or live your truth. <clears throat> right? There's a philosopher named, named David Berlinski who wrote a book called The Devil's Delusion. This is the seminal refutation of Dawkins' The God Delusion. I highly recommend it. And he quotes a French philosopher in this book, and he says, this, this philosopher says, imagine you have a magic button this magic button, if you press this button, all of the riches of the entire world will come into your possession immediately. It's like a genie, right? But there's one catch. If you press this button, one human being somewhere in the world will fall down dead. So he says, to whom will you entrust this button? An atheist who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in ultimate accountability, who believes that if he can get away with it, then he's going to get away with it. Or a theist who believes in God, who believes in ultimate accountability on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. Who would you entrust the button to? A theist. There are people who demand absolute bodily autonomy. 
What does autonomy mean? It means self-rule. I can do whatever I want with my body. My body, my choice. Good luck with that. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We don't read Quran. Inna lillahi. Indeed, we, lillah, lamb of tamlik, we belong to Allah. We don't own anything. I don't own my body. I don't, I don't own my wealth. I don't own my family. I own nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is malik and malik. He is king and owner. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيْدًا بِالْقُتِلَتْ When that innocent little beautiful baby girl will be asked on the Yom Al-Qiyamah for which crime she was killed. Can you imagine? This is proven. The majority of children killed by their parents are girls. No one wants to talk about this war on women. This is a global war on women. The other front of the war on women, there are multiple fronts, is when men appropriate the gender of women. When men think they can become women, like some sort of gender blackface. When womanhood becomes mockingly performative. When womanhood becomes a gender minstrel show. This will systematically erase that which makes real women unique, distinct, and precious. This is in the Quran. The male is not like the female. The Prophet ﷺ recognized this perennial problem in human society that people who don't believe recognize this perennial problem in human society, that people who don't believe in ultimate accountability will, will oppress those who are physically weaker. That's the law of the jungle. But we don't follow the law of the jungle. We follow the laws of revelation. This is why he says, The Prophet said, whoever has three daughters and shelters them and has compassion towards them, and protects and takes care of them. I guarantee paradise. Qila ya Rasulullah. Wa in kanat ithnatain. Somebody said, what about only two daughters? Qala fa in kanat ithnatain. Even if two. Qala fa ra'a ba'adul qawm. And lo qalu lahu wahida, la qala wahida. And some of the people thought that if they, if they had said to him, what about one daughter? He would have said even one. Notice he did not stop at shelters them shelters them, has compassion towards them, protects them, takes care of them. This is what a man does. A man protects, shelters, and has compassion towards women. He doesn't become a woman. This is a perversion, an inversion. This is inherently disordered. The Prophet Muhammad is addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran with the following words, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا خَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ it is part of the incredible mercy of your Lord that you deal gently with them. If you were harsh or hard-hearted, you would have seen people flee from your very presence. The Prophet ﷺ was gentle. He was a gentleman. This is a beautiful word in English. Gentleman. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever is deprived of gentleness is deprived of good. That doesn't mean a feminine man. Don't get the wrong idea. It means a truly masculine man. A truly masculine man is gentle, yet formidable and fierce, if need be. Muhammad Rasulullah, the Prophet and those who are with them are strict against hostile unbelievers, but merciful amongst each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Allah Oh, you will believe if you turn back from your religion, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a qawm, that He loves them and they love Him, lowly with the believers, but they have izzah. The, the unbelievers look at them and they start trembling. 
because the Muslims have Izza. They have honor, they have dignity. They're formidable in the eyes of the unbelievers. And they strive and struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So confidence, discipline, stoicism, strength, ambition, these are masculine qualities that men should never apologize for having. These are qualities of Muhammad Rasulullah wa nas qarni, and the best generation is his generation. Sometimes men must be violent. It's necessary, but it must be tempered for the sake of good, not evil. The solution is not to feminize men. Then who's going to take care of the violent men? Violence is necessary to create peace and check oppression. And here's another thing. Dawah is for non-Muslims. And Nasiha is for Muslims. But nowadays, as one of my teachers said, now we have to make Dawah to Muslims. Because for many of them, their fundamental aqidah is not sound. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there were liberal Muslims. They practiced Islam with a liberal flavor. But today, many Muslims are actually practicing liberalism with an Islamic flavor. There's a Muslim who gave a khutbah at a Catholic university. And in this khutbah, in passing, he mentioned that abortion is haram. The MSA tried to get him kicked out of school. The MSA. Muslim students in a Catholic university are trying to kick this khatib out of the university. Recently, a very influential person with a very huge social media following became Muslim. Alhamdulillah. However, he's a man who is perceived as a threat to feminism, the whole feminist project. Now check this out. There was a Muslim sister who tweeted that if he is welcomed as a Muslim, she will leave Islam. She will apostate and leave Islam. And she said, and I will deal with Allah on the day of judgment. Why? How could she possibly say this? Why would someone taking shahada threaten her Islam? The reason is because it seems like, I hope not, but it seems like her religion is not Islam with a dash of feminism. It is feminism with a dash of Islam. Hind bint Utba, who bit into the liver of Hamza radiallahu anhu, and Hamza was beloved to the Prophet sallallahu cannibalized, someone who is the Habib of Allah's Habib. She came to the Prophet sallallahu at the Fatha Mecca, and she was veiled, and she said, praise be to the one who made his religion victorious. He said, man ant, he said, Hind bint Utba, he said, marhaban, welcome to the religion. No one can turn away someone from the religion. Nobody can do this. This has nothing to do with you. Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, speak qawlan layyan, speak a gentle word to Fir'aun, the butcher of the Bani Israel. He might become Muslim. And if he became Muslim, those Israelites have to embrace him as their brother and not talk about his past sins. Imagine Cardi B becomes Muslim. Right? This is someone, basically a porn star, who brags about taking men into hotel rooms on the pretext of sex, and then pulls out a gun and robs them. And she's going on podcasts, and, 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 and oh, she's so empowered. Right? If this person becomes Muslim, we have to welcome her with open arms as a sister in the faith, and not mention any of those things. We don't own this religion. We have no say in whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, You cannot guide all those whom you love, but Allah guides. It is not up to you to guide people. You have no say in this affair. That's the Prophet Nowadays we have many challenges, theologically speaking. So as an ummah who's trying to be true to our tradition, to our scripture, to our Prophet to our scholastic community, we have many challenges. Of course there is the phenomenon of postmodernism. <clears throat> this idea that we are living in a post-truth society. There's no real truth, there's no real morality, right? Another challenge that is more insidious, seemingly meaning seeming, seemingly harmful, but uh, harmful nonetheless, 
is a philosophy called perennialism, which has permeated various quarters of Western academia. This idea that all major religions are theologically valid, that Christianity and Islam are both theologically valid, or that theological differences between these two religions are reducible to mere semantics. In other words, Trinity or Tawheed, it doesn't matter, right? Aquinas and Ghazali, they're saying basically the same thing. Augustine and Ibn Taymiyyah, they're saying the same thing. You know? This is false. This is false logically. This is false scripturally. Why do people go there? It makes them feel good. It's all about feeling. It's true that both religions are attempting to describe the same metaphysical reality, but the meanings of their respective ways of theologizing are clearly at odds. The Quran has a clear polemic against Christianity. You cannot deny it. Very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't say three. And he leaves it at three. Because there were Christians who said three gods. There's an ontological hierarchy. There are Christians who said uh, three persons and one God in the hypostatic hierarchy. There are Christians who say one person, one God, but three modalities. These are called the modalists. Patricassianism. There are Christians who say the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are Christians who say Father, Son, Mother. So both theologies cannot be true at the same time. This is a violation of a fundamental a priori law of being called the principle of contradiction. Either Isa is God or he's not. He cannot be both. Either the lights are on or they're off. Either it's raining or it's not. There's no third option. Principle of the excluded middle. Isa is either God or he's not. No third option. Either Islam is correct or Christianity is correct. Both can logically be wrong, but both cannot be right. If you read the Quran, it's very clear that there are things that the Christians got right. There are also things that they got wrong. And this is a really important point. The Quran is a theologically judgmental book. A theologically and morally judgmental book. Even if our society considers it politically incorrect or unwoke to pass judgment, on another person's religion or worldview, this does not change the reality that there is truth and falsehood, that the Quran purports to reveal the truth. Now there's a very uh, eye-opening documentary film that was recently made by a conservative commentator, a Catholic, named uh, Matt Walsh. It's called What is a Woman? Maybe you've heard of this. I highly recommend watching it. It actually blew my mind a little bit. So he interviews several people, but one of them was a college professor of Women and Gender Sexuality Studies, PhD, a self-proclaimed social scientist. He asked the professor the question, what is a woman? And the professor with his PhD cannot answer the question without saying the word woman. A woman is a woman. If he says that a woman is a human being with two X chromosomes, then he would be marginalizing transgender women, also known as men who have XY chromosomes. Then the professor gets frustrated and says, why are you asking? And Walsh says, I'm interested in getting to the truth. And upon hearing the words, the truth, the professor has a visceral reaction. And he says, I'm uncomfortable. You're condescending and rude. They can't stand the word truth. Very interesting. Why? Why does the word truth trigger, to use their term, these people? Do you know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. This is an aversion to God. Academia is becoming fundamentally anti-theistic. At first, academia was theistic, like Harvard, Yale, Georgetown. These started as Christian seminaries. Education used to be sought for the sake of God. Then academia became atheistic. There is no God. And if you believe in God, that's your business. Just keep it out of here. And now academia has become anti-theistic. Theistic, atheistic, anti-theistic. What does anti-theistic mean? Two things. Number one, the belief in God and practice of religion, religion need to go. You need to throw it away. Or if you insist on believing in God, and in traditional religion, then you must change your beliefs for the sake of hurt feelings. Otherwise, 
you are a patriarchal, misogynist, homophobic bigot. So Satan is not an atheist. Shaitan knows that God exists. If Qalim in insan ukfur, فلما كثرا قال إني بريء إني بريء منك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين. I don't know what that means. So he says to the human being, disbelieve. And when he disbelieves, Shaitan says to the human being, I disavow you. Inni Allah. I fear Allah, the Lord of the world. Satan is an anti-theist. He wants us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Disobey the Prophet sallallahu The Quran quotes him. Because you led me astray. Look at the satanic mentality. Self-victimization. Versus the Adamic mentality. What does Adam and Eve say? Oh, our Lord, forgive us. Personal responsibility. The Adamic mentality, personal responsibility. The Satanic mentality, self-victimization. Because you led me astray, I will lie in wait for them on your straight path. In other words, I will attack the people of your deen. I will assault Muslims and make them go crooked. The irony is that people who tend to stress tolerance the most tend to be the most intolerant to intolerance. It's quite ironic. It's like someone who says, be nice, you idiot. I had to take graduate school seminars for a PhD. I would say most of it, it was a total waste of time. Maybe 99% of waste of time. You're sitting in a classroom with other people and they're just venting with no knowledge. And the professor would give us a topic, and we have just debate with debate on this topic. So I remember one topic. It was about a rite of passage in a certain country for young boys. Okay? And I and I said, I believe that's child abuse. That's what I said. And this very woke student jumped all over me. How dare you make a judgment about another culture? How can you be so intolerant of someone else's belief? I said, yeah. How can you be so intolerant of my belief? And she didn't get the irony. <laughs> so everyone is to a certain degree intolerant. There are no exceptions. For many people on the left, like extreme liberals, and many Muslims feel like they need to support them for some reason. For many of them, the kum dina kum is not good enough. It's not nearly good enough for them. They want more than tolerance. They even want more than acceptance. They want to be celebrated. They don't want to be ignored. It, it, uh, ignorance is just tolerance. Do whatever you want. They don't want your thumbs up from a distance, or you know, one of these. Like, okay, I accept you. No, they want you to march in their parade. They want you to join the circus. And Muslim politicians in America do exactly that. I'm sorry to say. They join the circus. Everyone knows, you never join the circus. When the circus comes to town, you look at it, you are amazed by it, and then you go back to work. Well, you might say, well, who cares? Well, the problem is that extreme liberals dominate academia, social media, the entertainment industry, and the government absolutely capitulates to them. It's a grooming process. Why rainbows and unicorns? Why are these their symbols? Why not um, uh, trees and donkeys? Anything else? One reason is they want to attract children. And one of my teachers said the rainbow is actually a symbol of God's covenant with humanity, that he would never flood the earth or destroy the earth again. So they, cho they chose the rainbow as a way of mocking God, as if to say, ha ha ha, you can't destroy us. We're protected by the rainbow. What are you gonna do to us? Why Buzz Lightyear? It's grooming. You know, years ago, you sat down with your kids and you watched Toy Story, right? Nice movie. And then a few years later, hey kids, there's a sequel. Let's go. Yay. A few years later, hey, Toy Story 3. Let's go watch it in the movies. All right. Let's buy some popcorn. Beautiful. Let's buy the toys and the t-shirts. A few years later, look, a prequel. At this point, your kids love the whole franchise. 
It's been part of their lives for years. Let's go watch the prequel. Bam, homosexual love scene. This is ideological warfare. The Urla must say that you are either calling to something or you are being called to something. That's it. Two options. Pick an option. Personal feelings do not change objective facts about reality. Two plus two is four. An adult human male is a man. An adult human female is a woman. Truth is truth. Falsehood is falsehood. With the coming of our Master Muhammad sallallahu the Quran says, The truth has come. Not a relative truth or your truth and my truth. The truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Indeed, falsehood is ever vanishing. The Prophet sallallahu repeated this ayah when he was smashing the idols at the Kaaba in imitation of his forefather, the great iconoclast, our master Ibrahim alayhi salam. But according to Imam al-Razi in uh, Imam al-Tabari, this ayah refers more uh, generally to the coming of the Quran and the establishment of al-Islam. That Islam is the truth in the sense that it is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the ultimate truth. So for my remaining time, inshallah, um, I like to look at a few passages from Surah Ibrahim alayhi salam and just give me a wave when you need me to stop talking. Inshallah. So this is found in Surah 26, verses 75 to 89. It has two sections. And both sections are essentially didactic, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through our master Ibrahim alayhi salam, is teaching us something. So at the highest level, Allah is teaching us about himself. He's teaching us theology, which is the most noble of sciences, because subject matter is the greatest entity in existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Theology is asr din So in the first section, Ibrahim alayhi salam is speaking to his people about Allah. His people were the ancient Chaldeans who worshipped a pantheon of gods. They were mushrikim, polytheists. In the second section, Ibrahim alayhi salam is speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of a supplication, a dua. But you will see how Ibrahim alayhi salam's speech is transhistorical. In other words, how his speech is absolutely relevant for us today. It is timeless. So his speech begins with, Have you really considered what you worship, you and your ancestors? They're enemies to me, except the Lord of the worlds. And our Mufassirin say here that these verses are one of the strongest proofs against theological taqlid and for istidlal. So taqlid is blind conformance or uncritical faith. It is following someone without due inquiry. It is belief without evidence. Taqlid in matters of creed or theology is unacceptable. You have to be convinced. You have to actually believe what you claim to believe. And you should be able to explain your beliefs, even if it's just at a basic level. You don't have to be a theologian, but you have to know something. If you're praying because your father prays, and then your father dies and you stop praying, there's a problem. We should be able to explain, if only to ourselves, that God exists and that he is one. We should be able to explain uh, why we believe in the Prophet ﷺ, why the Quran is the word of God. We can use rational, historical, linguistic, and scriptural proofs. We believe because it is rational. Belief in God is rational. All of God's commandments are rational. Disbelief in God, is a type of idiocy. And Imam al-Ghazali said we should never refer to atheists as intelligent. It is a type of stupidity. In the same surah, Surah Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَتْ رُسُلُهُمْ أَفِ اللَّهِ الشَّكْ فَاتِرِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Their messenger said to them, Do you have doubt about Allah, the creator, the originator of the heavens and the earth? Do you really doubt that? The Quran doesn't even entertain atheism. There are no atheists. Everyone worships something. Who created this phone? Did it create itself? No. Who created this car out here? Did it create itself? No. Who created this building? Did it create itself? No. Who created this universe? Did it create itself? Yes. You're an idiot. <laughs> then Ibrahim salam said, The one who created me and guides me. 
Now he begins his theological monologue. Allah is the creator. He is the only creator in reality. Because logic tells us there can only be one creator. To ask the question, who created the creator, is nonsense. Why? Because by definition, the creator is uncreated. If the creator was created, then he's not the creator. If there was no beginning of the universe, if there was no creation ex nihilo, from nothing, then we are stuck in infinite regress, which is repugnant to the intellect. If the universe is infinite in the past, we would never get to today, because you cannot traverse an actual infinitude, an actual infinite number of events. As one of my teachers said, imagine you're standing in a line, and there's a, let's say I'm standing in a line full of men, there's a man in front of me, and I say to this man, hey brother, can I give you a hug? And this brother tells me, you have to ask the brother behind you. So I turn around and say, hey, can I give this guy a hug? And then he says, ask the guy behind me. Can I give him a hug? Ask the guy behind me. Can I give him a hug? Can I give him a hug? And this goes on ad infinitum. Would I ever give the brother a hug? Never. You cannot traverse an actual infinite number of events. Infinite regress dies at the door of the eternal. This is the only solution. It is intelligent to believe in one creator who created from nothing. Space, time, and, and matter came into being. So this creator is necessarily spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. He must be also extremely powerful because he brought all these things into being from nothing. He must be also highly intelligent. He must be also personal because he chose to create rather than not. So we have six attributes of God that are immediately known to the intellect. Just the akal. You don't need the knuckle here. Just the akal. And hua, he guides me. Emphasis on hua. The verb is imperfect. He alone guides me and continues to guide me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the majestic, all-powerful, timeless creator. But he is also in some sense intimate, personal, close to his creation. He is qareeb. He shows us the way. He's not some impersonal, distant, or removed God. He's not the God of the Greek philosophers. He's personal. When my servants ask you concerning me, say, I'm close to them. I answer the supplicant when he calls upon me. We created a human being and we know what his soul suggests to himself. We are closer to him than his jugular vein. He is with you wherever you are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with respect to what you do all seen. It's amazing. He continues, the one who feeds me and gives me the drink. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate source of life. The ultimate sustainer of our existence. And when I'm sick, he heals me. And sicknesses are of two types. One is psychosomatic, mind-body, and the other is spiritual. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, he said, when I am sick due to sin, he heals me with repentance. The Quran says about Ibrahim alayhis And then he cast a glance towards the stars and he said, I'm sick. Ibn Kathir, he said, the idolatry of his people made his heart feel sick. This was out of his compassion, that he loved his people and did not want to see their destruction. And the Prophet ﷺ was the same way. And we should be the same way. Perhaps you might worry yourself to death over them if they don't believe in this message. Kufur might make us sick to our stomachs. But we have to trust and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who causes me to die, then causes me to live. And then he says, And the one who I hope will forgive my sins on the day of judgment. And Mujahid said that this could be a reference to Surah Al-Anbiya verse 63 when Ibrahim a.s. quote unquote lied to his people about the largest idol destroying the smaller ones. But other ulama, they say, this is not actually a lie because his intention was not deception. His intention was to demonstrate an absurdity in their belief. 
that Ibrahim salam, was demonstrating the dangers and follies of theological taqlid. If you ask your average Christian, why do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? They'll probably say it's in the Bible. It's just a knee-jerk reaction. And as Muslims, we have to have enough knowledge to follow up with the answer, with the, uh, with, with the question of where? Show me where the Bible teaches the explicit doctrine of the Trinity. Produce book, chapter, and verse. And after finding nothing in the Bible, many Christians come to the realization that the only reason they believed in the Trinity was because of theological taqlid, blind imitation of their leaders. They were told to believe that God was three without seeing the evidence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the context of Christianity, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا أَهْوَانَ قَوْمٍ قَدْ ضَلُّوا مِنْ قَوْمٍ وَأَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَضَلُّوا عَنْ سَوَاءِ السَّبِيلِ O oh, people of the book, do not exaggerate in your religion beyond the truth, and do not follow the desires and caprices of a people who went astray, and, that, and thus led many others astray, and continue to stray from the right path. Dalal is mentioned three times. The Christian leaders who invented the Trinity went astray. Then with their theology, they led millions more astray than the Christians at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and today rejected him ﷺ, because he did not teach the Trinity, and thus they continue to go astray. Compounded balal. But the Quran wants to ask the Christians as well. Have you really considered what you worship? It's the same question Ibrahim salam asked his people. And like the people of Ibrahim salam, the Christians in principle worship Allah, the God of Abraham, but they need correction. Rabbi Habli Hukman wa Oh my Lord, grant me a judgment process and bind me to the righteous. This begins the second section of the Abrahamic monologue, his supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's still didactic. He's teaching us theology through dua. Rabbi, he says. Rabb, the Rabb denotes the personal deity. The Rabb is the one who takes care of you, loves you, sustains you, protects you. Habli, fi'l dua, grant me. Allah is al-wahhab, the one who gives us things even though we are undeserving. Give me a shukum. Turkman, a judgment process by which I might recognize the truth. In other words, a strong sense of discernment. All of us are born with a conscience. Conscience means with knowledge. We all have the ability to intuit to a certain extent what is good, bad, beneficial, harmful, what is beautiful, ugly. We have this naturally. We are not a tabula rasa. We're not a clean slate. So it seems. And this is what Socrates wanted to bring to the surface through the dialectic, but they didn't have wahi. These truths are in us. We already know these things. And the blessing of this ummah is that we have the Quran. We have wahi. We have, and the, one of the names of the Quran is a dhikr, the reminder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us these things clearly, and they are in conformance with our fitrah, with our nature. However, a lack of revelation, or bad education, or sin, or disobedience, or shaitan can delude us and deceive us, even to the point where the bad is seen as good, the ugly is beautiful, and the harmful is healthy. And some of the ulama say even our fitra can change due to bad socialization. And this is happening today, all over our society. So we need reminders. Today we have people who weigh 400 pounds, with purple hair, covered in tattoos from head to toe, and think that is beautiful. It's a total inversion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a sustained and sharp process of judgment by which we might uh, see the reality behind the form. And in this vein, the Prophet sallallahu supplicated, beautiful dua, Allahumma arina al-haqqa, haqqan wa razuqna ittiba'a. Oh Allah, show me the truth as truth and give me the, the ability to follow it. Wa arina al-baatila baatila wa razuqna ittiba'a. And show me the falsehood as falsehood and give me the ability to shun it. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذين يستبي, uh, يستحبون الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة ويسدون عن سبيل الله ويبغونها عوجا أولئك في ضلال بعيد Those who prefer the life of this world over the hereafter and who turn from the way of God, from the سبيل الله to seek to make it crooked this day who are far astray. Those who prefer this fleeting life 
of 60 to 70 years over the abode of permanence are not being rational. That is unintelligent, irrational thinking. Putting all your eggs in the basket of the dunya is irrational. When you know, and everybody knows this, that the specter of death lurks behind every corner, you don't know when you're going to die. You can die later tonight or before that. You can go at any time. We know this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whatever thing, whatever shape you're given, it is only the enjoyment of this life and this world and its ornament. But that which is with Allah is better and more lasting. Will you not use your intellect? Will you not be reasonable? <clears throat> Our master, Jesus, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, What does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? Our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, al kayisu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'da al-mawt wa al-ajizu man atba'a nafsahu hawaaha wa tamanna ala Allah. O kama qala alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam. The intelligent one is the one who subdues his lower self and works for that which comes after death. While the unintelligent one is the one who has, who has put his lower self in pursuance of its desires and has vain hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a person leads a hedonistic and selfish lifestyle against his better judgment and expects Allah to forgive him. That's not intelligent. That's not reasonable. This deen, this religion, is an intelligent deen. It's a thinking person's religion. A wise man once said, Would you rather hold a handful of dirt for several hours or a piece of gold for a moment? And the answer is, I don't want dirt. A piece of gold for a moment. And he continued, Yet there are people who would rather hold dirt for a moment than gold forever. There was a study conducted uh, on children years ago by a Stanford professor. There was a study on delayed gratification. And they found that children who preferred to have two cookies later rather than one cookie now, were generally more intelligent and successful later in life. Self-control, discipline, patience, these are markers of success in both worlds. This world is a shadow of the next world. Why would someone prefer this fleeting life over the hereafter? It's because they have doubt about the hereafter in their hearts. But rather than try to alleviate their doubts with serious and sincere study, they take the lazy way out and follow their hawa, their caprice, their desires, their lust, their feelings. And their feelings rule them. And then out of spite for those who engage the way of God, the sabil of Allah, which Imam Sayyidi says is al-Islam, out of spite for those who practice Islam, they seek to change Islam through lies, deviation, and falsehood. So as I mentioned, the people of knowledge say that you're either calling to something or being called. And right now in our society, we have people, deviants, openly saying to traditional people, we will convert your children. This is what they're saying openly now. No more hidden agendas, no conspiracy theories. They want to convert our children into accepting their deviant lifestyles and perverted philosophies. But in order to do this, they need Muslims to forsake their tradition and accept the current zeitgeist. They need us to accept this highly intolerant and coercive liberalism, this, what is it called now, the liberal world order, that has now openly declared ideological warfare on traditional religion. It's open, this is their project. They're, they're broadcasting it now. Why do they need Muslims? It's because we are gradually becoming the last line of defense when it comes to traditional religion in the world. We're all that's left. We are the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad And we've been entrusted with the Millah of Ibrahim and we must never allow ourselves to become bullied or intimidated. فَاسْتَقِمْ kama umirt. Be upright as you have been commanded. The Prophet said, this ayah to turn my hair gray. He had a few hair in his temples. They asked him, what has made your hair gray? He said, هُدْ وَأَخَوَاتُهَا be strong, resolute, stand up straight. A companion came to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, قُلْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قُلْ قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسْأَلُ عَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرَكَ Tell me something unique about the religion. The Prophet ﷺ said, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ That's it. Say, I believe in Allah and be upright upon this. 
There's not nothing secret. Ya ayyuhal mudaffir, qum fa anzir, wa rabbaka fa kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa tahir, wa rujza fa ahjur, wa la tamnun tastakthiru, wa li rabbika fa asbir. Stand up, warn people about their behavior, say Allahu Akbar, purify yourself, shun their defilements and idolatry, don't expect anything from them. It's okay, you don't need to become allies with them for what? You, you sell, sell the deen for what? For a miserable price? This is what Bani Israel did. Samanan Qalila for what? No, Hasbun Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough. This life is too short to be a salah. It's way too short. So this is our project. We have istiqamah. We're the last line of defense because the Jews no longer believe in traditional theology, Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. No, the historical critical method has destroyed the Torah. Most Jews are non-practicing. They go to the synagogue for uh, social purposes. And most Jews are actually reformed Jews, where they can eat whatever they want. And their sharia is op optional. And many of them don't even believe in God. I went to a reformed synagogue. The rabbi was an atheist. <laughs> and they were having breakfast, serving pork. And I said, SubhanAllah, this is, a, this is a synagogue. They said, yes. And they said, you want some of this bacon? I said, no, I don't eat bacon. And then I was sitting with some of the, the Jewish ladies. She said, you're more Jewish than our rabbi. <laughs> I said, SubhanAllah. <laughs> the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church saying some strange things. You know, he's constantly offending his traditional and conservative followers. This is a leader of more than a billion Catholics. Talking about, is there really a hell? And uh, it's okay, civil unions and something strange going on with this guy. Most Christian churches in the West have actually let the woke circus through their doors. They've capitulated to the same coercive liberalism that has overrun the academy like a scourge. They succumb to the mob that claim that their beliefs are not only offensive, but violence. Your beliefs are violent, they said. The mob said, and they bowed down to the mob. Yes. Yes. SubhanAllah, I mean, yes. And they let the circus in. And once you let the circus in, as I say, once you let the circus in, sooner or later, the clowns will run the show. This is why I can't even go to a church anymore. I used to do a lot of interfaith dialogue. I can't go anymore. Because it's all the circus. Amazingly, during this time, People in the West continue to convert to Islam. Allahu Akbar. It's not surprising. It makes sense. Islam is a religion of human fitrah. It appeals to our natural disposition. People naturally love monotheism. They're attracted to the simplicity of Muslim worship, bowing and prostrating without icons, no statues. They're attracted to the Prophet Sallallahu who was respectful to others, yet uncompromising when it came to his principles. They respect that. They're attracted to him because he's a gentleman. They see that, he's a real man. They're attracted to how Islam recognizes the difference and uniqueness of men and women. They're not equal. Sorry, they are equal, but not identical. They're equal, but not identical. They're compliments, not rivals, not antagonists. Go to now take a class at UC Berkeley Gender Studies. They say marriage is rape. This is what they're teaching. Marriage is rape because everything's power dynamics. And a man has physical power over you. So anytime there's an intimacy, it's rape de facto. Don't get married. You're a strong, independent woman. What do you need a man for? This is what they're teaching women. People are, are tired of this. And, and Islam for them is totally refreshing in the face of the current zeitgeist. And there's a place for urf. It's called culture. There's a maxim in the Sharia, al ma'ruf uh, al urfan kal mashru'i shar'an. That which is known through custom or culture is like that which is legislated through revelation. But there's a caveat. Any cultural practice must be circumscribed within the hudud, the bounds of the Sharia. It must not violate the revelation, <coughs> which is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ta'ata li makhlukin fi ma'asiyat al khaliq. There's no uh, obedience to creation and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you notice that children, because they're on the fitrah, children, they love Allah and His Messenger. And children with terminal cancer never complain because they accept the qadr. Go to a cancer ward full of children. They're sitting on beds with their bald heads. 
They're laughing, they're playing games, they're playing with their dolls, the parents are sitting there crying, weeping. The children are fine. They're awliya. But then they go to public schools and colleges and they become exposed to postmodern philosophy and critical theory and deconstructionism, atheistic materialism, radical feminism, post-structuralism, radical hermeneutics. This is all nonsense. Wallahi, it is nonsense. Go to a museum of modern art because modern art is the artistic equivalent of their literature. Go to the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art San Francisco. There's a pile of sticks on the ground. People looking, oh, amazing. So what are you looking at, this? There's one, there's the, a Wallahi, like a five-year-old took a crayon and went like this. And people looking at it, oh, oh, that is amazing. And I took my head, my daughter went through her, I went with her on a field trip, I'm looking at what? This is a joke. Their literature is just like this. It's all pseudo profound profundity. It's all like this a high falutin language that means nothing. It's nonsense. They make up these terms that mean nothing. There's one, it was blank. Wallahi. Blank canvas. People looking at it. <laughs> so we have these Muslim children going to this university, sitting in these classes. And this professor talking about the intersectional, uh, materialistic um, wave of the fourth. I don't, I don't understand this. I must be an idiot. That's what the Muslim is thinking. Because I don't get this. No. It's nonsense. Have istifam. Get in and get out of that class. Don't join any clubs. I can't believe it. I'm saying it. Don't even join the MSA. I can't believe it. I was the MSA president. All in time ago. At my college. We used to do Dawa. We used to have debates. Subhanallah. But their fitra takes a hit when they enter these schools and their common sense is questioned. But then eventually, they get older and wiser with experience. And then they start to do some real thinking on their own, inshallah, and they realize later, sadaqallah, wa sadaqa rasulullah, that these unnatural, deceptive, and irrational philosophies are making people miserable. These philosophies turn the world into a godless battleground where different identity groups are constantly vying for power. Everything becomes a struggle for power. These backward philosophies turn people into mean-spirited, self-righteous cynics. It bifurcates the world into two classes, the oppressed and the oppressor. And ironically, those who are often labeled as oppressed are actually the oppressors and vice versa. And Toba, Shukur, and Tawagur are thrown out the window. These are three of the greatest theological virtues. Toba, repentance, is replaced with living your authentic self. You need to just accept yourself. If you accept yourself, that you make your own rules, no right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. Let it go. This is from Frozen. This is a Disney movie. I make my own rules. I don't answer to anybody. Therefore, I can never sin. I don't have to make toba. MashaAllah. Sugar is replaced with self-victimization. I'm a victim. Who should I? Grateful to who? My dad? This misogynist? You mean the man who raised you? The man who loved you? The man who would give his life like this? Like this, he'll give his life to save your life? That misogynist? That guy? Who believes in two genders? <laughs> Then Tawadur is replaced with off-the-chart narcissism. Tawadur means humility. What's humility? Are you kidding me? Humility? People can't sleep at night. Oh, wake up at 3 in the morning. Oh, a new follower. Subhanallah. Adib and gharib. Anyway. The Prophet I'll end with this, John. I've gone over the time. Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam يَقُونَ فِي آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ تَجَّلُونَ كَذَّبُونَ يَأْتُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَحَادِيثِ بِمَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُ عَنْتُمْ وَلَا أَبَأَكُمْ فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ لَا يُدِلُّونَكُمْ وَلَا يُفْتِنُونَكُمْ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Towards the end of time, there's going to be flagrant habitual liars, imposters, who will make statements that neither you nor your ancestors have ever heard. In other words, they're going to say things that are absolutely irreconcilable with our faith tradition that no Muslim has ever heard, and yet they will justify themselves religiously. Now this is called radical hermeneutics. 
right? This is what our, our kids are exposed to in colleges. You know, you're going to take a class intro to the Quran. Oh, good luck. What's going to be your first assignment? A queer reading of the story of Lot in the Quran. The literary method of postmodernism is called deconstructionism. That's a term for the note takers. Deconstructionism, usually sisters take notes, the boys uh, already, they memorized them. There we go. <laughs> deconstructionism, what does it mean? There is no meta narrative, there is no orthodox or normative reading of any text. There's no normal reading. There's no, no such thing as orthodoxy. Don't let a bunch of oppressive, cisgender, heteronormative male ulama tell you what these verses mean. They can mean whatever you want. You see, they can't change the nas. They can't change the text of the Quran. If they could, they would. But they will butcher the tafsir. The Prophet ﷺ said, Beware of them, lest they misguide you or involve you in their fitna. The Prophet said, أَكْرِمُ الْعُلَمَا فَإِنَّهُمْ مُرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَا Honor the scholars. You know those same cisgender, heteronormative, honor the scholars. They are the inheritors of prophets. وَمَنْ أَكْرَمَ وَمَنْ أَكْرَمَهُمْ فَقَدْ أَكْرَمَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Whoever, uh, whoever uh, honors them has honored Allah and His Messenger. During this time, Allahu Akbar, the izza of this deen is being discovered by many non-Muslims. Allah is in charge. And they've noticed that there is something about Islam that prevents Muslims from surrendering their moral truth. They notice that there's something about Islam that prevents Muslims from groveling and genuflecting before the mob. That we have istiqama, we stand up straight. Allahu Akbar, people are coming to this deen. And we say to them, Whoever they are, marhaban. Welcome to this religion. Jazakallah khairan. Sorry for going over the time. That's the perfect time. We have both time for questions. Yes, or comments? Yes, sir. I think this question that I have will probably be applicable to everyone. How do we respond to individuals who ask us to use their preferred pronoun? And that pronoun is not in alignment with their biology. Yes. So I would I would just say I respectfully decline. <laughs> it's against my religion. We play the religion card. Yeah. Why not? So I, I'm a Muslim. It's against my religion. And if you say it like that, they'll get the. If you say I prefer, no. They go, oh, this guy's a bigot because he he, he thought about it. But if you say, if you, if you give it to them like this, it's against my religion, right? It's like forcing me to eat pork. Would you force me to eat pork? No, of course not. Okay. Don't force me to do something that's against my religion. That's how we have to frame it. This is my faith, this is my religion, and I have a First Amendment right, at least in this country, to practice my religion. And according to my religion, your pronoun doesn't match your gender. And I believe there's two genders. Oh, I'm triggered. Well, too bad. <laughs> too bad. People need to hear the truth sometimes. And maybe, Allah Ala, you know, there's a brother in this masjid who, <laughs> in high school, gave me a hard check. And I was angry with him. And I thought, well, I'm going to say this, brother. And then I just thought about him. And he's right. So internalize it, thought about it. If this person is refle uh, reflective, if he's honest with himself or herself, themself, no. <laughs> and inshallah will benefit them. Sometimes you need a, a little pinch of truth. But I would use that language. This is against my religion. Or sometimes at work they make you wear a little flag in June, like a little rainbow flag. Oh, we're wearing flags today. You know, this is against my religion. It's like forcing me to eat pork. It's like forcing me to worship an idol. Exactly like that. Just like that. None of this, uh, oh, none of the wish-washy stuff. Istiqama means, you know, you stand up straight. It's to the point. The Prophet ﷺ, his speech was very to the point. No kind of, you know, dilly-dally, wishy-washy. If they notice a little weakness, ah, 
this guy's a bigot because he has he has a choice, and he made a decision. He's not going to do it. That means that he is there's there's a little leeway there. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if you uh, you're aware of course. Uh, lately, uh, we see and saw some uh, uh, videos showing that uh, the, the, the teachers. I think the clowns are hearing us, don't you? <laughs> don't let them in! Keep the circus out! <laughs> but, uh, some teachers uh, are actually uh, encouraging uh, the children to join during the lunch race yeah. some of the clubs. Yeah. Uh, and they tell them not to tell their parents about it. So, what do we have to do? Actually, yeah. I'm not saying as Muslims, as straight people that believe in the Lord, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, Jewish, that actually know that uh, God has, you know, uh, punished uh, Saddam and Amurah because of what they were doing. So, yeah. what should we do now? Because this is the invasion and the breaking of the law of ethics of school. Yeah. SubhanAllah. So, yeah, that's what they do in kindergarten now. The teacher says, okay, boys, do you feel like a girl today? And immediately it's, it hits the fitra. And they go, the little boys go, come on, you can, who feels like a girl today? I feel like a boy today. And then nobody, and then the next day, okay, boys, who feels like a girl? They actually encourage them. So my advice is pull them out of a public school. A public school is an absolute pit of vipers. It's a, it's a, it's a L of old. Public school is just, I thought it was bad when I was in public school. Now I'm thinking like, a, you know, 1980s, like, you know, the Khomeini and Iran and things. I was like, oh, Salman Rushdie. Ah. That was paradise. Because that was just kids kind of, you know, being bullied. But now the curriculum, you just have to, you have to homeschool your kids. You have to homeschool them and, uh, you know, homeschool them. And then for high school, you sort of, you know, have to do a co-op or something. And then take your chances in college. Just go to from A to B. You know, uh, don't join any clubs and and um, do the best you can. Inshallah, it's difficult, but I, I don't uh, suggest going to public school. But this is getting it up. It's what we are giving up. up our rights in the public schools. Yeah, I mean, like so I said, can't we do something different? Yeah, you can do homeschool the kids. Do start a co-op. You're not giving up right. You're protecting children. We have some some. You know, you're right. Your children are more important than these rights to go to a public school. Public school is not beneficial for them anyway. Uh, some states they started making some uh, riots and uh, wanting to actually uh, you know dismiss the board of uh, of education, which happened in a couple of uh, states. Uh, I think in Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. Yeah. So this is actually one thing we have to support and we like. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, if it's not feasible to, you know, do something, if there's no other option, and the kid has to go to public school, then, yeah, you just have to hound these school boards and, and, you know, ask your children to be very honest with you with what they're reading and actually go physically to the library of these schools and look at some of these books. They actually display these books, My Two Dads, you know, Santa's Husband, um, <laughs> the other one. This book is gay. Yeah, they have pornographic pictures inside. This is for like, you know, elementary school children. This grooming, this is child abuse. And I would use that language again at the school board. I think this is child abuse, what you're doing to my son or daughter. Let them hear this language. You know? And just hound them, you know. You know, all the parents should show up in these school board meetings. Parents should be always talking to teachers. What did you teach my son or daughter? If there's no other option. But that's also difficult to do because people working are busy. And, you know, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. And then, you know, the child, he goes to, or she goes to, like, Sunday school, learns something about Islam, but it's only once a week. And, you know, the aunties and uncles are doing the best they can, but then they go to university and they listen to this professor with a double PhD who says, a woman is a woman! And they go, oh, oh that's so deep. Man, my, this uncle over here in the masjid, what, do, what does that guy know? He can't even speak English properly. 
It's actually, it's, it's, it's a fitna of our time. It's very different, very different than just 10 years ago. It's very, very different. All of this seeped in in the 90s, right? This was, um, it comes primarily from Foucault, this, this uh, French philosopher named Foucault, who actually uh, was a professor at, 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 at Tunis in the 1960s. So postmodernism is very, very prevalent, even in the Middle East. And uh, Noam Chomsky, who's at uh, MIT, is a professor of linguistics, he actually said that when he speaks in the Middle East, uh, the Muslims actually are, are more, uh, more skeptical about you know, objective truth than students in the West. Like he'll talk about history, and then the Muslims in the Muslim majority countries will say, how do you know what happened? You know, it's all your perception. There's no such thing as objective history. And this is everywhere, it's global. This is a global phenomenon. And you just read Foucault's works. I mean, this guy's an extremely disturbed individual. And of course, he kind of fell in love with these sort of pre-AIDS, San Francisco gay bar scene. And he died of AIDS, he was homosexual, he was a pederast. But that's their hero. You go to SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. Every year, these seminaries, they have an annual conference. These are Bible students. You go and just attend one of these sessions. They're quoting Foucault and Derrida. These are the two big guys. What, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Gospel of Matthew? No, no. Foucault, Derrida. Foucault, Derrida. Foucault, Derrida. Uh, um, First Kings, Deuteronomy, Genesis? No. These are their prophets. No. Mm -hmm. Does this have a question? Our hope is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This dunya, if you if you depend on the dunya, your heart will be broken. The dunya is made to break your heart. That's what the dunya is made to do. You can't depend on the dunya. Don't depend, you know, people that don't believe in an afterlife, they want they want justice in this world. They want to replace God with some sort of government. And that's happened in the past. And hundreds of millions of people died because they want absolute radical egalitarian laws. And it, they don't work because society is naturally hierarchical. You can't level all of society. You can't be just in an absolute sense. Only Allah is al-Adil. And on the day of judgment, we don't want justice from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one wants justice. He wants rahmah. On that day, you're not going to be saying, no justice, no, 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 no. You don't want justice. That doesn't mean that we don't try to be just in, in the world. Of course we try to. Adama is a very important, one of the cardinal virtues. You know, justice. But we understand that it's never going to, absolute justice will never manifest in this world. It's impossible. It will never manifest. There's always going to be injustice. It's the nature of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that we give you days of varying fortunes. We alternate these things amongst the people. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we will test you in this world. How does the ayah start? We're going to test you with loss of wealth and loss of uh, fruits of your labor, loss of your of your cells. People are going to die. Um, give glad tidings to the patient ones. This is our, our project in this world, is to be patient. And the world goes by quickly. There's no reason to sell out. You don't need an ally. Your only ally is Allah and His Messenger and the believers. That's all you need. And Allah is sufficient, Hasbun Allah, in reality. Right? When the, when the Mujahideen returned from uh, uh, Uhud. A munafiq in Medina, he said, People are gathering against you. Be afraid of them. What does the Sahaba say? Allah wa ni'mal wakeel. Allah is sufficient. He is sufficient as a disposer of affairs. In the next few years, it's going to be very difficult. 
It's going to be a very difficult life in you know, the next decade or so, two decades. It's going to get, it's going to, you know, there's ebbs and flows, but generally it's going like this. It's a downward, right? So people are going to be tested with their iman. So we have to have istiqamah. Read the Quran. Be acquainted with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Study the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did he deal with these situations? Everything's in the sunnah. How did he deal with situations? Read the stories in the Quran. How did you know, the, what, the, the Aad people? What, what, what was their sin? We have it now. What about Thamud? What about the brother mentioned? To call Malut. What about them? We have them now. The, the largest, the new LGBTQIA, whatever, capital of the world now is no longer San Francisco. You know what it is? San Francisco's been eclipsed. Goodbye, Frisco. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv in Israel. It's six miles from Sodom and Gomorrah. The largest parade on earth passes by the cities of the plains, not anymore. Look at us. What are you going to do now? <laughs> Even Isa, alayhi salam, according to the, uh, the Gospels, he sent his disciples out, and he says, whoever rejects the Gospel, shake the dust of that city off your legs, off your feet. The cities of, even the cities of Sodom and, and Gomorrah will fare better on the Day of Judgment than those cities. That means they're all going down. This is according to Isa alayhi salam in a Christian text. Three gospels. Matthew Martin Luke, he says this. But you go to a church at random, you see it's, it's a circus. What happened? Why did you sell out? Where's your religion? Allah says in the Quran, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah revealed. Let them judge. We want them to do that. We have that in common. No, they judge by. They're ahwa. What feels great? Whatever feels good, I guess. The age of feeling. Anyway. I think I've run. رَبَّ لَا تُقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمَاءُ سَمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَجِبَ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ سَيْدَ مُحَمَدٍ وَلَا أَلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ جْمَعِينَ بِرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَرْحَمُ الرَّحِيمِ الفاتحة جزاكم خيرا السلام عليكم